Um, welcome everyone to our spotlight on psychological careers. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to cover uh, the housekeeping. Um, this session today is being recorded and will be available on demand on the Humber North Yorkshire Careers Hub website. To help with the smooth running of the sessions, we have disabled delegates' videos and microphones. Um, if you do have any questions um, during the session, please do pop them in the chat box, um, but there will also be a Q&A session, I think, at the end of every presentation and also at the end if you want to ask any further questions. So my name is Melanie Drayton and I work for the Humber and North Yorkshire Healthcare Partnership as Careers Employability Programme Support Officer. Um, Humber North Yorkshire Healthcare Partnership formed in 2022 and comprised of NHS organisations, local councils, health and care providers, voluntary community and social enterprise organisations. The partnership is one of 42 integrated systems which covers England to meet health and care needs across an area, coordinate services and plan in a way. Um, that improve population health and reduces inequalities between different groups. We work across a geographical area of more than 1,500 square miles and serve a population of 1.7 million people, all with different health and care needs. Our area includes Hull, East Yorkshire, York, North Lincolnshire, sorry, North Yorkshire, uh, North East Lincolnshire. Um, in order for us to meet the health and care needs of our population, we need to ensure that we have appropriately skilled workforce reflective of the communities that we serve. So part of my role is to develop our talent pipeline and inspire and grow our future workforce. And one of the ways I do this is by delivering spotlight on webinars to showcase the range of careers available in the sector and highlight the variety of route ways into the sectors. So today I'm delighted to bring you this webinar and shine a spotlight on careers in psychology and the variety of routes into the sectors. Um, so today's session, we're going to have an introduction to psychology careers and then hear from some of our professionals about their careers and pathways into their roles. I'll hand over now to Dr. Elizabeth Darwell, who will give the overview of psychology professions and then talk. Lead. Oh. Are you, sorry, are you done? You faded out then, Mel. Done. You're done. OK, fabulous. Uh, so, yeah, this is um, me. I'm Liz Darwell. Um, I'm actually um, a systemic and family therapist and I work in CAMS, which is a child and adolescent mental health service. Um, so family therapists are part of the psychological professions. Um, but I'm not going to touch too much. We're not going to think there's quite a few professions that we're not going to cover today within the psychological professions because there may be careers that you come to a bit later on um, in your kind of trajectory. So I came into um, met the field of mental health as a nurse originally and then sort of developed into my family therapy pre um, profession. Um, but um, obviously, if you want to hear more about family therapy, I'm, I can talk about it forever and a day. So uh, please get in touch. Um, so the next slide, please. Um, I'm just going to do. Um, we don't need that because you've sort of done that. I'm just going to. So if we move on, yeah, I'm just going to provide a very quick context. Um, to the the group that is the psychological professions, because um, they are a broad mix of different disciplines um, and with different careers um, within those. Um, but um, but they, there is something that kind of connects them. And that is this idea of kind of how we think about and respond to people's emotional distress. So they might do that in different ways, depending on whether you're a psychologist or a cognitive behavioral therapist. But we're all really trying to reach the same aims um, as a group of professionals. We work with um, people and families across the lifespan um, at any different point in times. People can face struggles or difficulties that then become they sort of hit walls or find it really difficult to move forward. And that's when um, you might access some of someone from the psychological professions. Um, so, uh, yeah, next slide, please. Um, so these are the kind of this is the breakdown um, and you've got sort of three, three and a bit sections, really. You've got the psychologists in the first column 
Um, and we're going to hear from Lolly, um, who's a clinical psychologist, but there's obviously different different types of psychologists. And then in the middle section, we've got the psychological therapists. And like I said, if you can see, like the systemic family um, therapists are in there. These are professions that are quite often you need experience already. Um, they are um, professions that sometimes they're sort of called secondary professions, if you like, with the exception maybe of the, the cognitive behaviour therapists. And hoping that Ollie might be here a bit later to just say a, a bit about that. Um, and then the psychological practitioners, some of these are newer roles, but they they are both professions in themselves, uh, lifelong professions, but they're also really good entry points and kind of, you know, um, routes in that then you can develop into different careers. So they're sort of both really, but they've offered a lot of opportunities um, and there there is NHS funding for those training. So they're really good careers to be aware of and to understand how you might access that training. Um, and then you've got down at the bottom, you've got the assistant roles and we're going to hear from Kaz, who's a clinical associate in psychology. That's not an assistant role. It's an associate role. Um, the assistant psychologist um, uh, role is, again, a really good entry point into, you know, to developing um, and accessing other courses. Um, so, yeah, that's that's um, but we can't cover, cover all of those. I mean, it is a growing workforce. Um, and a really exciting workforce to be part of. Um, the next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the psychological profession, so like I say, we're a group, a wide group of different professions within that sort of taxonomy. Um, and mainly where you find us is in mental health services. I think probably we're all um, in mental health services today. Um, and I've worked in a, a wide um plus, you know, air, different areas. I've worked in inpatients. Um, I've worked in um, community settings in adult, um, young young people. I mean, it's a, such a growing field. Um, so um, quite often the mental health services are divided up into sort of age ranges, um, but also in terms of community and inpatient. So, I mean, it's not a dull career because you can move around and you can have um, lots of different experiences and really grow and learn and develop. But we're not only in, in mental health services. There are um, physical health settings where you find psychological professionals, probably more psychologists than any others, to be fair. Um, and, you know, that interface between mental health and physical health, our physical health affects our mental health and vice versa. Um, I've also worked in a prison. So, yeah, you'll find us loitering in prisons. Um, schools and sort of social care sectors and primary care. So in schools, you might find um, that's not on the taxonomy, things like um, people like educational psychologists. I don't quite know why they're not on the taxonomy, but Lolly might have the answer to that. Um, so, yeah, we are everywhere, but predominantly um, we are found in mental health services. Next slide, please. Um, and just to sort of touch on, yeah, these are some of the newer roles. Um, the slides that follow really are, you can sort of skip through um, a bit. Um, just in terms of the youth intensive psychological practice, so some of these new roles are really going well. They're really being embedded. Um, they feel really exciting and innovative. And some of them aren't taking so well, but they are very, very new. So in terms of the youth intensive psychological practitioners, I don't think we have any in this region. But again, that might be something that grows and develops. So it's always worth just keeping an eye on, you know, what new initiatives there are and new opportunities. Um, and the next slide, please. Um, and as Mel already said, we are um, there is a big sort of national drive to increase access to psychological therapies and to expand the workforce. Um, we really need people to come in, new people to come in and to have sort of fresh um, new um, people take up these careers. Um, so, yeah, we're looking to increase, we're looking to expand and we're also looking to diversify so that we have people in these professions that represent the communities that um, we work in. So there are quite a few um, schemes and funded schemes and opportunities um, for people that might be experiencing barriers to accessing training or opportunities, people from more marginalised groups. So, again, that's something that hopefully we've got some links for you to um, connect in with and find out about those schemes. Um, and the next slide, I think these are just information slides. So, yeah, 
pay, very important, what you're going to get paid. So you can have a look at that when the slides are shared. And the next slide, I think, are links. Yeah, so there's some just useful links and stuff that you might want to kind of have a look at after the, the webinar. And I think that's me done. OK, that's OK. PPN. OK, so we're going to go to Kate Reynolds now. Um, we've had a few technical issues, shall we say. Um, Kate, can you talk? I can. I hope oh, so. Excellent. Can you hear me? excellent. And we can hear you. So all good. Great. Um, welcome everybody. Um, so I'm a mental health and wellbeing practitioner. So I work in the Humber Trust. You might see that I just put there the MHWP. Uh, sometimes it's a bit of a mouthful, these new roles, so they will be abbreviated um, if you see them anywhere or as I speak. So just to tell you a little bit about me, um, I started, I was in the first cohort for this role in the Humber region. So it's very, it's new, it's a brand new role, just like um, Liz was talking about then, it's very much um, a promotional road, it, role into the psychological umbrella of practitioners. So I've been working doing it for two years now. Um, I'm really enjoying it. It's, it's great where we talk about how people enter into these roles. It's, this isn't my first job. I've worked in different industries, different sectors, but it's a very transferable role. So it's the skills that you may have learnt in other jobs that you can bring into this role as well, which is um, excellent for this role. Um, next slide, please. OK, so just to tell you a little bit about the role and how it works. So the mental health and wellbeing practitioners work with patients to help them manage their mental health, coordinate their care, help people access the best possible community and professional resources while offering evidence based psychological interventions. So really what we're helping patients do with this role and again, this is a role that's very flexible in where it sits in certain trusts. So some trusts will use the mental health and wellbeing practitioner for different levels of care for patients. For me, and um, the way that I will speak today is I'm actually um, in the primary care services for my patients, but the interventions are the same where, wherever it sits. So we've got a few that I'd just like to briefly talk about with you today. So we have the behavioural activation, which is really helping patients with depression. Um, it's teaching patients some of the skills to help themselves manage their own mental health. It's providing really useful tools and techniques for them to sort of help themselves. So it's really useful psychoeducation that you're providing with your patients. Um, graded exposure is very much helpful for anxiety teaching problem solving skills, encouraging good sleep, building confidence and recognising managing emotions. Again, they're such needed interventions that, you know, even in the couple of years that I've been doing this role, to actually see somebody engage in the work and helping themselves with their mental health, they really, it's an evidence-based psychological interventions that we're providing our patients with, with these new roles whether it's a short term piece of work of up to 12 sessions or you may be offering them more, however the trust adapts the role, you're still wanting to help the patient that managing their own mental health, which is so important. Um, yeah, next slide. Day in the life. This probably doesn't cover it all because the one thing that I actually love about this role is it's very varied. So all your patients have different backgrounds, they may be at different levels, but it gives you such flexibility to work with the patient at their needs, which is one of the things that I love. So this is just for myself how we can manage our role as a mental health and wellbeing practitioner, is you may be that first person to meet the patient. So you're really doing that mental health assessment, getting to know them, their back background, but you may be able to facilitate the whole journey of that patient from assessment through to actually managing their care and being able to complete the intervention which makes that a lot smoother for the patient. The other thing is obviously you've got the sessions yourself that you're actually with the patient but that doesn't end there you've got your preparation for the session you've also got your recording of your notes which is a big part of the role so that's obviously your administration work then you may have a lot of team meetings um, with your own team. 
um, multidisciplinary across the networks and things. There's a lot of meetings go on there. You've got your supervision, which is a really important part of the role. Um, and just talking about myself and in the last couple of years, that supervision is, is really important with your own manager and your own clinical supervisor and your development as a practitioner, because you're coming from maybe from all different experiences as practitioners to develop your own learning. Um, it's taking your patients' cases and discussing them. It's is really valuable part of well, my learning, especially. Um, and then training. So that's doing different training courses um, by the trust or external and your own um, continuous professional development is still a part of your role. So, yes. Next one. So this is just to talk a little bit about the training. Um, so as I said, I was actually started my training in March um, 2022 for this role. It was a one year course that I did and it is very Oh dear, she may have froze. Should we move on to the next person or should we give her a minute or two? Mm -hmm. Not um, I'm happy. I'm aware we've got quite time, quite tight time. So I'm happy to go if you want and then stop and yeah. go back to Kate if that helps. Yeah, she looks pretty frozen at the moment. I know. <laughs> there's no there's no movement whatsoever, is there? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there we go. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Sorry, Kate. <laughs> so I'm Lolly. I'm a clinical psychologist um, and I work with adults with mental health difficulties um, in Humber. Next slide, please. So um, I guess what a clinical psychologist is, I found this quite hard to summarise because the job is so varied um, and I think there's lots of depictions of it in the media or on TV that maybe aren't that representative or sometimes are I guess of what we actually do um, so we are the kind of official line I guess is that we're healthcare professionals and we are especially trained in assessing mental health difficulties um, and working with people to help manage them and um, hopefully work through them and um, improve their kind of quality of life and how how they're feeling at the end of that and it's a really um, varied role so um, like Liz mentioned at the start you can end up working in loads of different places from schools, prisons, um, mental health hospitals, physical health hospitals, um, community teams, yeah, with loads of different people as well. So you can work right across the lifespan with children, with teenagers, adults, um, older adults. So it is, is really varied. It's one of the really good things about it, I think. And yeah, you can work in lots of different ways as well. So sometimes I might work with someone one-to-one -one, or I might work in in couples or groups or um, with the teams that work with that person so it is there is a lot of flexibility in the role which is something I think is really good about it and yeah it can involve loads of different aspects and I think maybe one of the things that people might come into the profession thinking is that if you're a psychologist your main job is therapy or a therapist when that's actually really just a small part of, of the job. It is an important part, but there's lots of other things that we're involved in doing as well around kind of um, conducting research or supervising research, delivering therapy, leadership within kind of the team or the trust that you're working in, developing services, providing teaching and training to other colleagues. Um, and yeah, depending on where you're working, because I guess, um, you know, you might sometimes provide things like expert witness work and reports. Um, thinking about what you were saying before about educational psychologists. So, yeah, clinical psychologists, one type of psychologist. There's lots of other types, forensic. And I'm not sure if I'm freezing. Am I still here? No, you're OK. OK, cool. Thanks. Forensic um, psychologists, uh, or organisational psychologists who work in businesses, um, educational psychologists. There's a big range of different types. and educational wouldn't show up on that taxonomy because they're not funded by the NHS um, oh, right. they're funded by a different body but there is um, 
like funded places provided by the government if you did want to apply for those and train as an educational psychologist. Um, but I've got some links at the end for different types of psychologists where you can have a look at that later. Next slide, please. So like um, Kate was saying, it's really hard to summarise a day in the life. I've tried my best um, and I've split it into kind of direct work face to face with clients and kind of indirect work, which is actually a really big part of my job. So not necessarily working in a room with a client, but working with other um, professionals or the kind of system and people are, that surround the, the individual client or patient who might be in our team. So in terms of the face to face stuff, um, yep, yeah, I'll do assessments or so meet with someone. I'll have a think about what they might be struggling with, what they might need support with and how our service can meet, can kind of meet those needs. But as a clinical psychologist, you're also trained to do um, cognitive assessment. So we might assess someone's memory, um, whether they've got a learning disability, um, how they're able to kind of um, use information day to day and, and use that to kind of function and um, live their life in a way that's sort of meaningful to them. So that's kind of one part of my job. And I'd write a report up about that afterwards. Um, therapy so trained in lots of different models of therapy and I guess one of the things about being a psychologist is that you can kind of draw on little bits of different models as long as it's sort of based on evidence and research to support somebody but can provide that kind of really tailored um, help to somebody um, and sometimes I'm involved in running groups so this can be groups with clients around specific difficulties or um, something a bit more general but again it's drawing on those evidence-based therapy models taking some of that and trying to apply it in a group setting. And then the kind of indirect stuff. So um, Kate mentioned about supervision. So um, you also have your own supervision as a, as a clinical psychologist, but then you also supervise other members of staff. So um, part of my job involves meeting with them to support their well-being, to think about the work they're doing with clients um, and to kind of give advice and support around making sure that the, the clients that we see get the best care kind of possible. Um, kind of linked to that, I guess, is um, a lot of my job involves consultations. So I'll meet with um, someone who's supporting a, a client and we might have a think about um, a plan for their care. If, if we're a bit stuck, what can we try and do about it to support them? Are there any areas or um, kind of skills or resources that we could bring in to help support that person better? Um, and then, yeah, the kind of blue bits, I'm involved in del delivering a lot of training to other professionals. Um, and um, trainees, uh, psychologists as well, and also team meetings. So kind of sitting in those, sometimes taking a lead on some of those as well to try and bring a bit more um, psychological thinking and theory into um, the kind of day to day stuff that we do. So whistle stop tour of the day in the life. <laughs> I'm not really doing it any justice. <laughs> Next slide, please. So in terms of becoming a clinical psychologist, there's sort of two routes. There's the kind of main route, um, which I've put in these boxes here, and then there's another one I'll talk to you about in a minute. So typically, um, someone would get an undergraduate degree in, in psychology, and it's really important to make, make sure if you're interested in being a psychologist that the uni degree that you do is accredited by the BPS, so the British, Psycholog the British Psychological Society. Um, that's like a, a kind of standard you have to meet um, in part of this training pathway so if you're interested just make sure you check that out when you're applying to universities and at this point well, when you graduate you usually need a 2-1 or higher and that takes three years to do your undergraduate degree usually you also need relevant um, I said clinical but any experience that relates to this job so um, maybe working as, a, as an assistant psychologist or one of the other um, psychological professional roles that um, Liz mentioned, um, voluntary experiences. So I did a lot of um, volunteering to get experience. Um, lots of people work with Samaritans or community groups to get experience of working with clients. So it's not about doing therapy with them. It's about, I guess, learning about mental health um, distress and, and how we can help people. And sometimes people will do a master's degree. Um, and it's quite hard to put a window, I guess, on how long that stage can take. It really varies. It's quite competitive to get on to clinical doctorate training, which is kind of the next step. So for some people that can happen quite quickly, but others, they might um, have to apply a couple of times before they get on that training. So that's what's in that blue box. So the kind of step there is is the doctorate in clinical psychology. So it's like um, 
a clinical PhD, you're employed by the NHS and um, it involves sort of three strands of doing research, um, going to lectures, learning more about clinical psychology and then also going on placements in NHS settings um, and that takes three years to do that. So it's quite a long, a long time. <laughs> And the kind of green bit at the bottom, I just wanted to mention that if you go to the University of York or the University of Hull, there's a fast track um, training route for the clinical doctorate. So that that speeds things up in terms of you would do your undergraduate degree in psychology and then straight on to your doctorate in clinical psychology. And that's the training route that um, I was lucky enough to, to get on and take. So it's just to be aware of that because people in the area aren't always aware of it. Um, but again, there's more information about that at the end of my slides. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is the last one. So um, just some information there about um, the training routes, different types of psychologists um, and then some kind of more uh, places where you can find out a bit more information about what it is a psychologist does or um, things I think are helpful or worth looking at if you're thinking about a career in this area. I hope I'm not taking up too much time. <laughs> No, no, I think we're on track. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Are we going back to Kit or are we going straight to mine? I think she's back in. I think I've unmuted. Hello. Oh, oh hi. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to go back to your, where you left technology? off? Oh, yeah, I know. I'm so sorry. I've been <laughs> having a flap here. <laughs> <laughs> just have My to remind you, don't worry, just remind you where we were. Was that it... one. Yeah. Uh, one back. That one? one? No, back. back one. Yeah, that, that one. Oh, My okay. apologies. Um, internet's worry. joys of working online, isn't it? <laughs> um, my apologies if I'm going to repeat myself just a little bit, but I was just saying about the training programme for the mental health and wellbeing practitioners that um, it is a very con packed course it's literally 12 months of developing your skills practically and academically for the role um, where you're practicing really delivering the psychological interventions and obviously doing your care planning for your patients so it is an advantage I do feel for this course is that you are doing it as a band four and you're really paid to train and then you would obviously hopefully on completion of the course you would be able to go up to a band five so it's a really good role to be you're actually doing your training alongside learning the role in practice as well despite it being quite intensive and taking a lot of your time um it was it's forever developing as well from the university point of view because for us we were the first sort of group doing the course but it is developing and as the role is itself as well so it's forever changing um, I've put, I know this little link on there as well, that I'm sure I'll come out with the slides just for some more information on that route as well, if you want to have a look at it. Thank you. Next slide. So these are just a couple of things that I really wanted to mention about the role. For me, it was that I wanted to be involved and invested in something, an umbrella of the psychological professions that forever changing. It's something that's been promoted across the country and obviously our area. And there's a lot of different exciting opportunities to practice your skills and really helping somebody. And that's maybe just the second point that I've put there. I find it a really rewarding role. It's something that I've done a lot of different jobs in my career in different areas, different sectors. But for me, this is really it's a personal satisfactory sort of empathy when you're helping somebody else that's feeling really low and at a really difficult time of their life. And you can help facilitate that change. It's it's very re rewarding, despite being a really challenging role. Um, so I just wanted to mention that it's, it is challenging. You're forever balancing your day in the life of but it's that difference that you are making for that person to know that you're helping them with their own mental health is yeah I don't think I've done anything else but that's more rewarding than this um so I've mentioned about the paid employment so I won't go on about that um so there's different entry routes so for this role obviously I'm, I'm not going to read all of this out but there is different levels um there's an undergraduate route and there's also a postgraduate route depending on what level of um, entry you're going into training for the job so it's worth really just exploring this role they really are wanting 
um, people to come in from different practices, whether it's your first role or your first sort of job, or you've maybe come in from different industry or sector, it's really worth looking at this um, role moving forward. OK, uh, next slide. So okay. sorry that that was cut short and it was a little bit not put together. So has anybody got any questions they'd like to ask about the mental health and wellbeing practitioner role? I think it's OK. I'll check the chat after the webinar and then um, people can answer any questions in the chat. And uh, okay. yeah. Those. Okay. Yeah, that's great. And um, Oliver's, I know, don't. Um, Oliver's on the call as well, and he's actually my supervisor, so he knows the role inside out as well. So he'll gladly help with any Q and A's at the end if needed. Okay, okay. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Very thank, much. You. thank you. Right, thanks. Bye bye. 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 Hi everyone. Hi, I'm Kaz. I'm a clinical associate psychologist and um, I work for Humber NHS and I'm currently based in Hull so I cover the primary care mental health networks in Hull and also some work into the community mental health teams in Hull as well. So in terms of what is a clinical associate psychologist um, I've put in brackets there as well CAT because that's what a lot of people shorten it to. Um, as Kate was saying, the really sort of long title, so it's sometimes helpful to shorten it down a little bit, which I'll probably do as I talk throughout um, the role as well. So it is a, a new role. Um, it's, I think, it, the first cohort of um, trainee CAPS was in Exeter in 2018, so it is still quite a new role. Um, in terms of within Humber, Myself and my three colleagues are the first in Humber to train as, as CAPS. Um, so the idea of the CAP role really was designed to fill a gap between assistant psychologists and qualified clinical psychologists. Um, so it was really trying to sort of bridge that gap um, between sort of skill set and what was offered really. Um, in terms of the definition of a CAP, it's defined as a specialist mental health professional who's trained to assess, formulate and treat people within specified age range, ranges. So um, within this part, the, the, one of the main differences between sort of a CAP and a clinical psychologist is that we were trained to work with sort of one um group of people so for example I work with adults in mental health and um, there are other caps that can work with children um, but it's one or the other unless you did birth trainings um, whereas clinical psychology is is different in that they would train to work across all of that. Um, we do work autonomously but we also work under the supervision of a clinical psychologist so we would have a supervisor we would sort of make up our own treatment plans um, and then go to our, our supervisor and just check that out with them and make sure that we're working in line with what we need to within our role. Um, we would generally work and treat people in a variety of different settings. So there are CAPs that might work in community settings, um, hospitals, secure settings, GP surgeries and even crisis teams as well. Um, we sometimes do visit clients in their own home, normally for sort of assessments and things if they're not able to get out. Um, and in terms of the work, a lot of the work is generally one to one, um, but we do deliver group interventions as well. So one of the groups um, that our team are sort of running at the moment or starting to run again in September time is a trauma stabilisation group and then a coping with emotions group, which Lolly's also been involved in as well. Um, we can also be involved in things like research and service evaluation as well. We do bits of staff training um, around different interventions. We also offer things like staff support for wellbeing. And um, another thing that we're starting to think about doing soon is supervision for the staff members as well. Ready for the next slide, thank you. So a typical day for a CAP. Um, some of these things are probably quite similar to what Lolly was talking about. So we do lots of different things really in a day um, and week to week it would vary as well depending on what we've got at that point in time. So we do things like assessments and um, these can be extended assessments so thinking about um, a person's history of mental health going back to sort of childhood and their experiences growing up as well and trying to think about that and how that might have affected them and um, we would put that into some type of formulation as well. Uh, we do one-to-one -one therapy, so uh, we're trained in lots of different therapy models, so we can do um, 
lots of different things for people and like Lolly said as well we can also pick different bits from different models um if that feels helpful at that point in time for that client um we do staff training consultations for other staff members as well so thinking about um, what might be helpful for somebody else's patient or even just a consultation to see whether or not somebody would benefit from working with a calf we attend our own supervision, so we do that on a fortnightly basis where we meet with our supervisor and discuss all of our clients. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, we'll be providing supervision to other staff um, coming up shortly. We attend meetings, um, quite a lot of meetings sometimes, um, but a lot of our work, I think, really for us would be around the one-to-one -one therapy or group interventions and assessments, that type of thing. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned, group interventions is another one. Not currently doing that at the moment, but it'll be starting again from September time. So um, just a little bit on how to become a CAP. So typically you need to have an undergraduate degree in psychology. Um, similar to what Lolly said, it needs to be accredited by the BPS. And um, for applying for a CAP role, you need to have a minimum of 2-2 in your psychology degree. They do also um, consider like conversion degrees, but again, that has to be like an approved one by the BPS. Um, the middle bit is around sort of experience. So it's, I guess experience is quite an important one to have had prior to applying for the CAP role. It's a really competitive role to get into. Um, for me, I did a lot of during my undergraduate degree and sort of in the middle bits between um, starting as a as a trainee calf I did lots of different voluntary roles so working in Samaritans working as an outreach volunteer for the whole crown court so did different voluntary roles prior to um working in the NHS in different support roles first so I had quite a bit of experience doing different things some of them paid some of them voluntary um all of those things in terms of experience were really helpful in just sort of gaining knowledge and um I guess, skills in working with people in general. Um, so the experience would need to be sort of within um, a health or mental health or psychology service, really. And then in terms of the training, it's an 18 month full time training apprenticeship, which leads to a master's degree on completion. So the training is hosted by an employer. So you are paid while you're doing the training. Um, it's a band five paid role for training. And then once you qualify and um, have finished everything for uni, you would go up to a band six. Um, so in terms of, sort of how, what the training looks like, this could probably be quite different for different universities, depending on where you are based. But for um, the CAPS that trained in Humber, we were based at Sheffield University. That isn't any longer um, being offered at the moment but I'm sure there will be other universities nearby that will be offering this as a training program. But ours was split. So we had two days at university every week. And then the other three, day, three days we were based in um, our clinical settings, which was for us based in Hull in the community teams, um, working with clients and really building up your skills in the area, practicing the therapy models that you were learning. Um, and I've just put at the bottom a little note to say that there's no current vacancies for CAPS within Humber at the moment, for trainee CAPS within Humber. Um, but there are other posts elsewhere in the country. So if people are willing to travel, there are um, posts available for our trainee CAPS. And I'm ready for the next slide. Thank you. And then I've just um, added a couple of links onto that previous slide. So if anybody does want to look into anything any further, um, there's a couple of different links there to have a little look at for um, clinical associate psychologists. And then there's even one here for looking at training courses in the area as well. So you can put in your postcode and it brings up any training courses in the um, area near where you live. Thank you. Okay, are we handing over to Ollie now? Is that directed at me or Liz? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I can Definitely go. you. <laughs> so I've not done a fancy presentation, but I will send over what I've got um, for everyone to have a look at. So uh, I'm a CBT therapists. So I currently work in Humber NHS. Um, so I work across 
primary care and secondary care. So primary care is more um, mild to moderate mental health difficulties, mainly anxiety and depression. Um, secondary mental health being more kind of severe and enduring mental health problems. Um, so I suppose in the NHS as a CBT therapist, um, I guess what we tend to work with then. So um, we use approaches that have been scientifically proven to work. So I think Lolly touched upon it earlier, you know, if there's a scientific evidence base for something. Um, so we don't just, you know, kind of make things up. Um, there's lots of different kind of treatment models that we would use for different problems. So for example, um, treating a client with depression would look very differently to someone who's struggling with OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, so the evidence base then recommends that CBT um, is an effective approach, kind of frontline first type approach to use with people who have anxiety. So it could be panic attacks, OCD, post-traumatic stress disorder, generalized anxiety, which is excessive worrying, social anxiety, things like this. And there's also evidence to suggest it's useful for people experiencing um, schizophrenia, psychosis, bipolar disorder. So those more kind of personality disorders, longer term mental health problems, um, some long term health conditions as well, such as chronic fatigue. Um, there are specific CBT therapists who can work with children as well. Um, so problems with child mental health. Um, sleep difficulties and anger management we can kind of work with as well. Um, so I suppose a day in the life of a CBT therapist, and we'd probably see you know four or five clients a day in different settings. So currently I'm based at home, so I see um, clients remotely over Microsoft Teams. Um, sometimes though I will venture out to different places, so I might go to uh, half an hour one way to Ghoul and see a client there, and then maybe half an hour a different way to Driffield and see a client there and just kind of go where, where I'm needed at the moment. Um, so certain kind of bases, they might be GP surgeries or they might just be you know rooms that the NHS have acquired in kind of different buildings. Um, so there's quite a variety. Um, and I do quite like getting out and going, going to a different base as well. Um, so, what I do with my other time then is doing kind of clinical notes. So obviously we need to keep a record of uh, what we're doing with people just in case um, I suppose they ever come back. People might want to know, well, what have you been kind of doing with them? What model were you using? What problem were you trying to treat? That sort of thing. Uh, we might make referrals to other services. We might kind of support other colleagues. Uh, we might engage in supervision, which has been discussed. Or we would engage in supervision, have team meetings, all that sort of stuff. Um, so we can do individual work one to one, um, or we can run groups as well, um, which is something I'm currently involved in. Um, so I think that's probably about it for that. I suppose when it comes to the um, kind of routes into the NHS, there's two main routes. So um, going back to what I'd mentioned about primary care and secondary care, those are the two main routes really. So what they have in primary care um, in what was formerly called IAPT, which is now called NHS Talking Therapies, um, a CBT therapist employed in that particular environment would be called a high intensity CBT therapist. So you might have seen or you might come across some of those roles. Um, so what that is, is for people experiencing mild to moderate symptoms of anxiety and depression. So those courses, that's how I trained. Um, so they are uh, recruit to train posts. So they are a band six salary while you train, uh, which is currently around £33,000 a year. Um, so they're kind of 12 to 18 month programs. Um, and obviously you get your tuition paid for while you train. And then once you've completed that training, um, then you do go up a band, um, get a nice pay rise along with it. Um, the secondary mental health program um, is normally a two-year program. Again, 
kind of funded at a band six and likely to be a band seven upon completion. Uh, but a little bit different in the sense that year one would focus on your mild to moderate anxiety, um, I suppose, um, psychological disorders like we've discussed, OCD, social anxiety, things like that. In year two, um, you'd focus more on um, personality disorders, which are you know more long term and kind of severe. So um, bipolar, borderline personality disorder, schizophrenia, things like that tend to be the main the main ones. Um, so in order to progress onto one of these, so you can go and train as a CBT therapist in other settings, but they wouldn't be kind of the NHS route, and you very unlikely that you probably get paid while you're training as well. Um, so in order to get onto one of the um, two NHS CBT therapist programs, you'll normally need an undergraduate degree um, or a core profession. So a core profession would be um, something that's already kind of registered in a mental health setting. So it might be, you know, a social worker or a a mental health nurse or a counsellor um, or an occupational therapist, something like that that's kind of classed as a core profession. Um, so once you've got that, it's you know fairly straightforward to get on to the training. If you don't have the core profession, that's where you'll need the undergrad degree, uh, but you'll also need evidence um, that you have got the uh, so knowledge, skills and attributes that are required. So that's called the KSA, which is the knowledge, skills and attributes. Now it's a hefty portfolio that you need to do it just to get on to the course. Um, so if you've got a psychology undergrad, I think you need to do four modules um, to evidence. If you don't have a psychology undergrad, if it's something else, like for example, my wife did fashion, and then went to train as a CBT therapist, she needed to do 11, uh, 11 modules, which, which was quite a big piece of work. So you have to evidence um, that you've had training in things like childhood development, um, various kind of approaches, systemic approaches, humanistic approaches, things like that. So it's quite a big piece of work. Um, so you might have to do that as well. So looking at the um, slides earlier, there are psychological practitioner roles like the MHWPs um, and psychological wellbeing practitioners, things like this, um, where you, you know, you'll certainly accrue um, a lot of evidence to kind of uh, complete the KSA, but you might have to do a little bit more work for that. Um, so the easiest route would be the kind of core profession if any of you are looking at you know other kind of social work or anything like that or mental health nursing um, once you've got that then it's, it's quite easy to get onto the uh, not easy but straightforward um, to get onto the CBT training so last bit from me then um, I suppose yeah it's just a kind of 60 minute sessions normally weekly um, and you know, depending on what settings you work, you might have a caseload anywhere from kind of 15 up to kind of 40 people at a time that you work with. Um, and I think that's about it from me. Yeah, that's everything I'd prepared. Thank you, Ollie. So interesting. OK, so we'll just go on to the last few slides, I think, as time's ticking along. Um, I just want to thank everyone um, and all our guest speakers for their time today and sharing their experiences. Um, so this little poster here to um, highlight our um, Careers Hub website on which you can search for um, careers, you can search and apply for jobs and apprenticeships and there's lots of useful guides for um, CV writing and interview techniques. Um, and also exploring um, education and training pathways into the best route into the sector that you're looking for. Um, so I hope that you found the session useful um, in learning about psychology careers and the route ways in. And finally, before we close the session, I'd be most grateful if you could take part in a poll. Um, I'll send that out straight after the um, session is finished, um, just to get some feedback on the session. Um, 
and I think we are now at the end of the session. So once again, just thank you to everyone for attending today and to our guest speakers for sharing their um, experiences, pathways and um, advice.